Toward Zero by Agatha Christie Read by Hugh Fraser Prologue, November the 19th The group round the fireplace was nearly all composed of lawyers, or those who had an interest in the law. There was Martindale, the solicitor, Rufus Lord, K.C., young Daniels, who had made a name for himself in the Carstairs case, a sprinkling of other barristers, Mr. Justice Cleaver, Lewis of Lewis and Trench, and old Mr. Treves. Mr. Treves was close on eighty, a very ripe and experienced eighty. He was a member of a famous firm of solicitors, and the most famous member of that firm. He was said to know more of Baxter's history than any man in England, and he was a specialist on criminology. Unthinking people said Mr. Treves ought to write his memoirs. Mr. Treves knew better. He knew that he knew too much. Though he had long retired from active practice, there was no man in England whose opinion was so respected by the members of his own fraternity. Whenever his thin, precise little voice was raised, there was always a respectful silence. The conversation now was on the subject of a much-talked-of case which had finished that day at the Old Bailey. It was a murder case, and the prisoner had been acquitted. The present company was busy trying the case over again and making technical criticisms. The prosecution had made a mistake in relying on one of its witnesses. Old de Pleach ought to have realised what an opening he was giving to the defence. Young Arthur had made the most of that servant girl's evidence. Bentmore, in his summing up, had very rightly put the matter in its correct perspective. But the mischief was done by then. The jury had believed the girl. Juries were funny. You never knew what they'd swallow and what they wouldn't. But let them once get a thing into their heads and no one was ever going to get it out again. They believed that the girl was speaking the truth about the crowbar, and that was that. The medical evidence had been a bit over their heads. All those long terms and scientific jargon. Damned bad witnesses, these scientific johnnies, always hemmed and hawed and couldn't say yes or no to a plain question. Always, in certain circumstances, that might take place, and so on. They talked themselves out, little by little, and as the remarks became more spasmodic and disjointed, a general feeling grew of something lacking. One head after another turned in the direction of Mr. Treves for Mr. Treves had as yet contributed nothing to the discussion. Gradually it became apparent that the company was waiting for a final word from its most respected colleague. Mr. Treves, leaning back in his chair, was absent-mindedly polishing his glasses. Something in the silence made him look up sharply. Er? he said. Er, what was that? You asked me something? Young Lewis spoke. We were talking, sir, about the Le Mans case. He paused expectantly. Yes. Yes, said Mr. Treves. I was thinking of that. There was a respectful hush. But I'm afraid, said Mr. Treves, still polishing, that I was being fanciful. Yes, fanciful. Result of getting on in years, I suppose. At my age one can claim the privilege of being fanciful if one likes. Ah, yes, indeed, sir said young Lewis, but he looked puzzled. "'I was thinking,' said Mr. Treves, "'not so much of the various points of law raised, though they were interesting, very interesting. If the verdict had gone the other way, there would have been good grounds for appeal, I rather think, but I won't go into that now. I was thinking, as I say, not of the points of law, but of the, well, of the people in the case.' Everybody looked rather astonished. They had considered the people in the case only as regarding their credibility or otherwise as witnesses. No one had even hazarded a speculation as to whether the prisoner had been guilty or innocent, as the court had pronounced him to be. Human beings, you know, said Mr. Treves thoughtfully. Human beings. All kinds and sorts and sizes and shapes of them. Some with brains and a good many more without— They'd come from all over the place. Lancashire, Scotland, that restaurant proprietor from Italy, and that schoolteacher woman from somewhere out Middle West. 
all caught up and enmeshed in the thing, and finally all brought together in a court of law in London on a grey November day, each one contributing his little part, the whole thing culminating in a trial for murder. He paused and gently beat a delicate tattoo on his knee. I like a good detective story, he said, but you know, they begin in the wrong place. They begin with the murder. But the murder is the end. The story begins long before that, years before sometimes, with all the causes and events that bring certain people to a certain place at a certain time on a certain day. Take that little maidservant's evidence. If the kitchen maid hadn't pinched her young man, she wouldn't have thrown up her situation in a huff and gone to the Lamorns and been the principal witness for the defence. Or that Giuseppe Antonelli coming over to exchange with his brother for a month. The brother is as blind as a bat. He wouldn't have seen what Giuseppe's sharp eyes saw. If the constable hadn't been sweet on the cook at number 48, he wouldn't have been late on his beat. He nodded his head gently. All converging towards a given spot. And then, when the time comes, over the top, zero hour. Yes, all of them converging towards zero. He repeated, towards zero. Then he gave a quick little shudder. Oh, you're cold, sir. Come nearer the fire. No, no, said Mr. Treves. Just someone walking over my grave, as they say. Well, well, I must be making my way homewards. He gave an affable little nod and went slowly and precisely out of the room. There was a moment of dubious silence, and then Rufus Lord Casey remarked that poor old Treves was getting on. Sir William Cleaver said, an acute brain, a very acute brain. But Anno Domini tells in the end. Got a groggy heart, too, said Lord. May drop down any minute, I believe. Oh, he takes pretty good care of himself, said young Lewis. At that moment, Mr. Treves was carefully stepping into his smooth-running Daimler. It deposited him at a house in a quiet square. A solicitous butler valet helped him off with his coat. Mr. Treves walked into his library, where a coal fire was burning. His bedroom lay beyond, for out of consideration for his heart, he never went upstairs. He sat down in front of the fire and drew his letters towards him. His mind was still dwelling on the fancy he had outlined at the club. Even now, thought Mr. Treves to himself, some drama, some murder to be, is in course of preparation. If I were writing one of these amusing stories of blood and crime, I should begin now, with an elderly gentleman sitting in front of the fire, opening his letters, going, unbeknownst to himself, towards zero. He slit open an envelope and gazed down absently at the sheet he had abstracted from it. Suddenly his expression changed. He came back from romance to reality. Dear me, said Mr. Treves, how extremely annoying. Really, how very vexing. After all these years, this will alter all my plans. Open the door, and here are the people. January the 11th. The man in the hospital bed shifted his body slightly and stifled a groan. The nurse in charge of the ward got up from her table and came down to him. She shifted his pillows and moved him into a more comfortable position. Angus McWhirter only gave a grunt by way of thanks. He was in a state of seething rebellion and bitterness. By this time it ought to have been over. He ought to have been out of it all. Curse that damned ridiculous tree growing out of the cliff. Curse those officious sweethearts who braved the cold of a winter's night to keep a tryst on the cliff edge. But for them, and the tree, it would have been over. A plunge into the deep icy water, a brief struggle perhaps, and then oblivion. The end of a misused, useless, unprofitable life. And now where was he? 
lying ridiculously in a hospital bed with a broken shoulder and with the prospect of being hauled up in a police court for the crime of trying to take his own life. Curse it! It was his own life, wasn't it? And if he had succeeded in the job, they would have buried him piously, as of unsound mind. Unsound mind, indeed. He'd never been saner, and to commit suicide was the most logical and sensible thing that could be done by a man in his position. Completely down and out, with his health permanently affected, with a wife who had left him for another man, without a job, without affection, without money, health, or hope. Surely to end it all was the only possible solution. And now here he was in this ridiculous plight. He would shortly be admonished by a sanctimonious magistrate for doing the common-sense thing with a commodity which belonged to him and to him only, his life. He snorted with anger. A wave of fever passed over him. The nurse was beside him again. She was young, red-haired, with a kindly, rather vacant face. Are you in much pain? No, I'm not. I'll give you something to make you sleep. You'll do nothing of the sort. But do you think I can't bear a bit of pain and sleeplessness? She smiled in a gentle, slightly superior way. Doctor said you could have something. I don't care what doctor said. She straightened the covers and set a glass of lemonade a little nearer to him. He said, slightly ashamed of himself, ah, Sorry if I was rude. Oh, that's all right. It annoyed him that she was so completely undisturbed by his bad temper. Nothing like that could penetrate her nurse's armour of indulgent indifference. He was a patient, not a man. He said, Damned interference! All this damned interference! She said reprovingly, No, no, that isn't very nice. Nice? he demanded. Nice? My God! She said calmly, You'll feel better in the morning. He swallowed. You nurses! You nurses! You're inhuman, that's what you are. We know what's best for you, you see? That's what's so infuriating. About you. About a hospital, about the world. Continual interference. Knowing what's best for other people. I tried to kill myself. You know that, don't you? She nodded. Nobody's business but mine whether I threw myself off a bloody cliff or not. I'd finished with life. I was down and out. She made a little clicking noise with her tongue. It indicated abstract sympathy. He was a patient. She was soothing him by letting him blow off steam. Why shouldn't I kill myself if I want to? he demanded. She replied to that quite seriously. Because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? She looked at him doubtfully. She was not disturbed in her own belief, but she was much too inarticulate to explain her reaction. Well, I mean... It's wicked to kill yourself. You've got to go on living, whether you like it or not. Why have you? Well, there are other people to consider, aren't there? Not in my case. There's not a soul in the world who'd be the worse for my passing on. Haven't you got any relations? No mother or sisters or anything? No. I had a wife once, but she left me. Quite right, too. She saw I was no good. You've got friends, surely? No, I haven't. I'm not a friendly sort of man. Look here, nurse. I'll tell you something. I was a happy sort of chap once. Had a good job and a good-looking wife. There was a car accident. My boss was driving the car, and I was in it. He wanted me to say that he was driving under thirty at the time of the accident. He wasn't. He was driving nearer fifty. Nobody was killed. Nothing like that. He just wanted to be in the right for the insurance people. Well, I wouldn't say what he wanted. It was a lie. I don't tell lies. The nurse said, Well, I think you were quite right. Quite right. You do, do you? That pig-headedness of mine cost me my job. My boss was sore. He saw to it that I didn't get another. My wife got fed up seeing me mooch about, unable to get anything to do. She went off with a man who had been my friend. He was doing well and going up in the world. I drifted along, going steadily down. I took to drinking a bit. That didn't help me to hold down jobs. Finally, I came down to hauling. Strained my inside. The doctor told me I'd never be strong again. 
Well, there wasn't much to live for then. Easiest way, and the cleanest way, was to go right out. My life was no good to myself or anyone else. The little nurse murmured, You don't know that. He laughed. He was better tempered already. Her naive obstinacy amused him. My dear girl, what use am I to anybody? She said, confusedly, well, You don't know. You may be. Some day. Some day? There won't be any some day. Next time I shall make sure. She shook her head decidedly. Oh, no, she said. You won't kill yourself now. Why not? They never do. He stared at her. They never do. It was one of a class of would-be suicides. Opening his mouth to protest energetically, his innate honesty suddenly stopped him. Would he do it again? Did he really mean to do it? He knew suddenly that he didn't. For no reason. Perhaps the right reason was the one she had given out of her specialized knowledge. Suicides didn't do it again. All the more he felt determined to force an admission from her on the ethical side. At any rate, I've got a right to do what I like with my own life. No. No, you haven't. But why not, my dear girl, why? She flushed. She said, her fingers playing with the little gold cross that hung round her neck, You don't understand. God may need you. He stared, taken aback. He did not want to upset her childlike faith. He said mockingly, I suppose that one day I may stop a runaway horse and save a golden-haired child from death, eh? Is that it? She shook her head. She said with vehemence and trying to express what was so vivid in her mind and so halting on her tongue, It may be just by being somewhere, not doing anything, just by being at a certain place at a certain time. Oh, I, I can't see what I mean, but you might just, just walk along a street some day and just by doing that accomplish something terribly important, perhaps even without knowing what it was. The red-haired little nurse came from the west coast of Scotland, and some of her family had the sight. Perhaps dimly she saw a picture of a man walking up a road on a night in September, and thereby saving a human being from a terrible death. February the 14th There was only one person in the room, and the only sound to be heard was the scratching of that person's pen as it traced line after line across the paper. There was no one to read the words that were being traced. If there had been, they would hardly have believed their eyes. For what was being written was a clear, carefully detailed project for murder. There are times when a body is conscious of a mind controlling it, when it bows obediently to that alien something that controls its actions. There are other times when a mind is conscious of owning and controlling a body and accomplishing its purpose by using that body. The figure sitting writing was in the last-named state. It was a mind, a cool, controlled intelligence. This mind had only one thought and one purpose, the destruction of another human being. To the end that this purpose might be accomplished, the scheme was being worked out meticulously on paper. Every eventuality, every possibility was being taken into account. The thing had got to be absolutely foolproof. The scheme, like all good schemes, was not absolutely cut and dried. There were certain alternative actions at certain points. Moreover, since the mind was intelligent, it realized that there must be intelligent provision left for the unforeseen. But the main lines were clear and had been closely tested. The time, the place, the method the victim. The figure raised its head. With its hand it picked up the sheets of paper and read them carefully through. Yes, the thing was crystal clear. Across the serious face a smile came. It was a smile that was not quite sane. The figure drew a deep breath. As man was made in the image of his maker, so there was now a terrible travesty of a creator's joy. Yes, everything planned. Everyone's reaction foretold and allowed for the good and evil in everybody played upon 
and brought into harmony with one evil design. There was one thing lacking still. With a smile, the writer traced a date. A date in September. Then, with a laugh, the paper was torn in pieces, and the pieces carried across the room and put into the heart of the glowing fire. There was no carelessness. Every single piece was consumed and destroyed. The plan was now only existent in the brain of its creator. March the 8th Superintendent Battle was sitting at the breakfast table. His jaw was set in a truculent fashion, and he was reading, slowly and carefully, a letter that his wife had just tearfully handed to him. There was no expression visible on his face, for his face never did register any expression. It had the aspect of a face carved out of wood. It was solid and durable, and in some way impressive. Superintendent Battle had never suggested brilliance. He was definitely not a brilliant man, but he had some other quality, difficult to define, that was nevertheless forceful. "'I can't believe it,' said Mrs. Battle, sobbing. "'Sylvia!' Sylvia was the youngest of Superintendent and Mrs. Battle's five children. She was sixteen, at a school near Maidstone. The letter was from Miss Amphrey, headmistress of the school in question. It was a clear, kindly, and extremely tactful letter. It set out in black and white that various small thefts had been puzzling the school authorities for some time, that the matter had at last been cleared up, that Sylvia Battle had confessed, and that Miss Amphrey would like to see Mr. and Mrs. Battle at the earliest opportunity to discuss the position. Superintendent Battle folded up the letter, put it in his pocket, and said, "'You leave this to me, Mary.' He got up, walked round the table, patted her on the cheek, and said, "'Don't worry, my dear. It'll be all right.' He went from the room, leaving comfort and reassurance behind him. That afternoon, in Miss Amphrey's modern and individualistic drawing-room, Superintendent Battle sat very squarely on his chair his large wooden hands on his knees, confronting Miss Amphrey and managing to look far more than usual every inch a policeman. Miss Amphrey was a very successful headmistress. She had personality, a great deal of personality. She was enlightened and up-to-date, and she combined discipline with modern ideas of self-determination. Her room was representative of the spirit of Meadway. Everything was of a cool oatmeal colour. There were big jars of daffodils and bowls of tulips and hyacinths, one or two good copies of the antique Greek, two pieces of advanced modern sculpture, two Italian primitives on the walls. In the midst of all this, Miss Amphrey herself, dressed in a deep shade of blue, with an eager face suggestive of a conscientious greyhound, and clear blue eyes looking seriously through thick lenses. The important thing, she was saying in her clear, well-modulated voice, is that this should be taken the right way. It is the girl herself we have to think of, Mr. Battle. Sylvia herself, it is most important, most important, that her life should not be crippled in any way. She must not be made to assume a burden of guilt. Blame must be very sparingly meted out, if at all. We must arrive at the reason behind these quite trivial pilferings. A sense of inferiority, perhaps? She is not good at games, you know. An obscure wish to shine in a different sphere, the desire to assert her ego? We must be very, very careful. That is why I wanted to see you alone first, to impress upon you to be very, very careful with Sylvia. I repeat again, it's very important to get at what is behind this. That, Miss Amphrey, said Superintendent Battle, is why I have come down. His voice was quiet, his face unemotional, his eyes surveyed the schoolmistress appraisingly. I have been very gentle with her, said Miss Amphrey. Battle said laconically, Good of you, ma'am. You see, I really love and understand these young things. Battle did not reply directly. He said, I'd like to see my girl now, if you don't mind, Miss Amphrey. With renewed emphasis, Miss Amphrey admonished him to be careful, to go slow, not to antagonize a child just budding into womanhood. Superintendent Battle showed no signs of impatience. He just looked blank. She took him at last to her study. They passed one or two girls in the passages. 
They stood politely to attention, but their eyes were full of curiosity. Having ushered Battle into a small room, not quite so redolent of personality as the one downstairs, Miss Amphrey withdrew and said she would send Sylvia to him. Just as she was leaving the room, Battle stopped her. A uh, one minute, ma'am. How did you come to pitch upon Sylvia as the one responsible for these, er, uh, leakages? My methods, Mr. Battle, were psychological. Miss Amphrey spoke with dignity. Psychological? Hmm. What about the evidence, Miss Amphrey? Yes, yes, I quite understand, Mr. Battle. You would feel that way. Your uh, profession steps in, but psychology is beginning to be recognized in criminology. I can assure you that there is no mistake. Sylvia freely admits the whole thing. Yes, yes, I know that. I was just asking how you came to pitch upon her to begin with. Uh, well, Mr. Battle, this business of things being taken out of the girls' lockers was on the increase. I called the school together and told them the facts. At the same time, I studied their faces unobtrusively. Sylvia's expression struck me at once. It was guilty, confused. I knew at that moment who was responsible. I wanted not to confront her with her guilt, but to get her to admit it herself. I set a little test for her, a word association. Battle nodded to show he understood. And finally the child admitted it all. Her father said, I see. Miss Amphrey hesitated a minute, then went out. Battle was standing looking out of the window when the door opened again. He turned round slowly and looked at his daughter. Sylvia stood just inside the door, which she had closed behind her. She was tall, dark, angular. Her face was sullen and bore marks of tears. She said timidly rather than defiantly, Well, here I am. Battle looked at her thoughtfully for a minute or two. He sighed. I should never have sent you to this place, he said. That woman's a fool. Sylvia lost sight of her own problems in sheer amazement. Miss Humphrey? Oh, but she's wonderful. We all think so. Hmm, said Battle. Can't be quite a fool, then, if she sells the idea of herself as well as that. All the same, Meadway wasn't the place for you. Although I don't know, this might have happened anywhere. Sylvia twisted her hands together. She looked down. She said, I'm... I'm sorry, father. Really, I am. So you should be, said Battle shortly. Come here. She came slowly and unwillingly across the room to him. He took her chin in his great square hand and looked closely into her face. Been through a good deal, haven't you? He said gently. Tears started into her eyes. Battle said slowly, You see, Sylvia, I've known all along with you that there was something. Most people have got a weakness of some kind or another. Usually it's plain enough. You can see when a child's greedy or bad-tempered or got a streak of the bully in him. You were a good child, very quiet, very sweet-tempered, no trouble in any way. And sometimes I've worried. Because if there's a flaw you don't see, sometimes it wrecks the whole show when the article is tried out. Like me, said Sylvia. Yes, like you. You've cracked under strain, and in a damn queer way, too. It's a way, oddly enough, I've never come across before. The girl said suddenly and scornfully, I should think you've come across thieves often enough. Oh, yes, I know all about them. And that's why, my dear... Not because I'm your father, fathers don't know much about their children, but because I'm a policeman, I know well enough you're not a thief. You never took a thing in this place. Thieves are of two kinds. The kind that yields to sudden and overwhelming temptation, and that happens damn seldom. It's amazing what temptation the ordinary, normal, honest human being can withstand. And there's the kind that just takes what doesn't belong to them, almost as a matter of course. You don't belong to either type. You're not a thief. You're a very unusual type of liar. Sylvia began. But, he swept on, you've admitted it all. Oh, yes, I know that. There was a saint once. Went out with bread for the poor. Husband didn't like it. Met her and asked what was in her basket. She lost her nerve and said it was roses. He tore open her basket, and roses it was. A miracle. 
Now, if you'd been St. Elizabeth, and were out with a basket of roses, and your husband had come along and asked what you'd got, you'd have lost your nerve and said bread. He paused, and then said gently, That's how it happened, isn't it? There was a longer pause, and then the girl suddenly bent her head. Battle said, Tell me, child, what happened exactly? She had us all up, made a speech, and I saw her eyes on me, and I knew she thought it was me. I felt myself getting red, and I saw some of the girls looking at me. It was awful. And then the others began looking at me and whispering in corners. I could see they all thought so. And then the amp had me up here with some of the others one evening. We played a sort of word game. She said words, and we gave answers. Battle gave a disgusted grunt. And I could see what it meant, and I... I sort of got paralysed. I tried not to give the wrong word. I tried to think of things quite outside, like squirrels or flowers. And the ant was there watching me with eyes like gimlets, you know, sort of boring inside one. And after that, oh, it got worse and worse. And one day the ant talked to me quite kindly and so understandingly, and I broke down and said I had done it, and, oh, Daddy, the relief! Battle was stroking his chin. I see. You do understand? No, Sylvia, I don't understand, because I'm not made that way. If anyone tried to make me say I'd done something I hadn't, I'd feel more like giving them a sock on the jaw. But I see how it came about in your case, and that gimlet-eyed amp of yours has had as pretty an example of unusual psychology shoved under her nose as any half-baked exponent of misunderstood theories could ask for. The thing to do now is clear up this mess. Where's Miss Amphrey? Miss Amphrey was hovering tactfully near at hand. Her sympathetic smile froze on her face as Superintendent Battle said bluntly, In justice to my daughter, I must ask that you call in your local police over this. But, Mr. Battle, Sylvia herself— Sylvia has never touched a thing that didn't belong to her in this place. I quite understand that as a father— I'm not talking as a father, but as a policeman. Get the police to give you a hand over this. They'll be discreet. You'll find the things hidden away somewhere, and the right set of fingerprints on them, I expect. Petty pilferers don't think of wearing gloves. I'm taking my daughter away with me now. If the police find evidence, real evidence, to connect her with the thefts, I'm prepared for her to appear in court and take what's coming to her. But I'm not afraid. As he drove out of the gate with Sylvia beside him, some five minutes later, he asked, Who's the girl with the fair hair? Rather fuzzy, very pink cheeks and a spot on her chin, blue eyes far apart. I passed her in the passage. Oh, that sounds like Olive Parsons. Oh, well, I shouldn't be surprised if she were the one. Did she look frightened? No, looked smug. Calm, smug look I've seen in the police court hundreds of times. I'd bet good money she's the thief. But you won't find her confessing. Oh, not much. Sylvia said with a sigh. Oh, it's like coming out of a bad dream. Oh, Daddy, I am sorry. Oh, I am sorry. How could I be such a fool, such an utter fool? I do feel awful about it. Ah, oh, well, said Superintendent Battle, patting her on the arm with a hand he disengaged from the wheel and uttering one of his pet forms of trite consolation. Don't you worry. These things are sent to try us. Yes, these things are sent to try us. At least I suppose so. I don't see what else they can be sent for. April the 19th The sun was pouring down on Neville Strange's house at Hindhead. It was an April day such as usually occurs at least once in a month, hotter than most of the June days to follow. Neville Strange was coming down the stairs. He was dressed in white flannels and held four tennis rackets under his arm. If a man could have been selected from amongst other Englishmen as an example of a lucky man with nothing to wish for, a selection committee might have chosen Neville Strange. He was a man well known to the British public, a first-class tennis player and all-round sportsman. Though he had never reached the finals at Wimbledon, he had lasted several of the opening rounds, and in the mixed doubles had twice reached the semi-finals. 
He was, perhaps, too much of an all-round athlete to be a champion tennis player. He was scratch at golf, a fine swimmer, and had done some good climbs in the Alps. He was thirty-three, had magnificent health, good looks, plenty of money, an extremely beautiful wife whom he had recently married, and to all appearances no cares or worries. Nevertheless, as Neville Strange went downstairs this fine morning, a shadow went with him. A shadow perceptible, perhaps, to no eyes but his. But he was aware of it. The thought of it furrowed his brow, and made his expression troubled and indecisive. He crossed the hall, squared his shoulders as though definitely throwing off some burden, passed through the living room, and out onto a glass-enclosed veranda, where his wife Kay was curled up amongst cushions, drinking orange juice. Kay Strange was twenty-three and unusually beautiful. She had a slender but subtly voluptuous figure, dark red hair, such a perfect skin that she used only the slightest make-up to enhance it, and those dark eyes and brows which so seldom go with red hair and which are so devastating when they do. Her husband said lightly, "'Hello, gorgeous. What's for breakfast?' Kay replied, "'Horribly bloody-looking kidneys for you and mushrooms and rolls of bacon.' "'Sounds all right,' said Neville. He helped himself to the aforementioned viands and poured out a cup of coffee. There was a companionable silence for some minutes. Ooh, said Kay voluptuously, wriggling bare toes with scarlet manicured nails. Isn't the sun lovely? England's not so bad after all. They had just come back from the south of France. Neville, after a bare glance at the newspaper headlines, had turned to the sports page, and merely said, Hmm. Then, proceeding to toast and marmalade, he put the paper aside and opened his letters. There were a good many of these, but most of them he tore across and chucked away. Circulars, advertisements, printed matter. Kay said, I don't like my colour scheme in the living room. Can I have it done over, Neville? Anything you like, beautiful. Peacock blue, said Kay dreamily, and ivory satin cushions. You'll have to throw in an ape, said Neville. You can be the ape, said Kay. Neville opened another letter. Oh, by the way, said Kay, Shirty has asked us to go to Norway on the yacht at the end of June. Rather sickening, we can't. She looked cautiously sideways at Neville, and added wistfully, I would love it so. Something, some cloud, some uncertainty, seemed to hover on Neville's face. Kay said rebelliously, Have we got to go to dreary old Camilla's? Neville frowned. Well, of course we have. Look here, Kay, we've had this out before. Sir Matthew was my guardian. He and Camilla looked after me. Gull's Point is my home, as far as any place is home to me. Oh, all right, all right, said Kay. If we must, we must. After all, we get all that money when she dies, so I suppose we have to suck up a bit, Neville said angrily. It's not a question of sucking up. She's no control over the money. Sir Matthew left it in trust for her during her lifetime, and to come to me and my wife afterwards. It's a question of affection. Why can't you understand that? Kay said after a moment's pause, Oh, I do understand, really. I'm just putting on an act, because, well, because I know I'm only allowed there on sufferance, as it were. They hate me. Yes, they do. Lady Tressilian looks down that long nose of hers at me, and Mary Alden looks over my shoulder when she talks to me. It's all very well for you. You don't see what goes on. They always seem to be very polite to you. You know quite well I wouldn't stand for it if they weren't. Kay gave him a curious look from under her dark lashes. They're polite enough, but they know how to get under my skin, all right. I'm the interloper. That's what they feel. Well, said Neville, after all, I suppose that's natural enough, isn't it? His voice had changed slightly. He got up and stood looking out at the view with his back to Kay. Oh, yes, I dare say it's natural. They were devoted to Audrey, weren't they? Her voice shook a little. Dear, well-bred, cool, colourless Audrey, Camilla's not forgiven me for taking her place. Neville did not turn. His voice was lifeless, dull. He said, After all, Camilla's old, past seventy. Her generation doesn't really like divorce, you know. 
On the whole, I think she's accepted the position very well, considering how fond she was of... of Audrey. His voice changed just a little as he spoke the name. They think you treated her badly. So I did, said Neville under his breath, but his wife heard. Oh, Neville, don't be so stupid. Just because she chose to make such a frightful fuss. She didn't make a fuss. Audrey never made fusses. Well, you know what I mean. Because she went away and was ill, and went about everywhere looking broken-hearted. That's what I call a fuss. Audrey's not what I call a good loser. From my point of view, if a wife can't hold her husband, she ought to give him up gracefully. You two had nothing in common. She never played a game, and was as anemic and washed up as a, as a dish rag. No life or go in her. If she really cared about you, she ought to have thought about your happiness first, and been glad you were going to be happy with someone more suited to you. Neville turned. A faintly sardonic smile played round his lips. What a little sportsman! How to play the game in love and matrimony! Kay laughed and reddened. <laughs> well, perhaps I was going a bit too far. But at any rate, once the thing had happened, there it was. You've got to accept these things. Neville said quietly, Audrey accepted it. She divorced me, so that you and I could marry. Yes, I know. Kay hesitated. Neville said, You've never understood, Audrey. Oh, no, I haven't. In a way, Audrey gives me the creeps. I don't know what it is about her. You never know what she's thinking. She's... she's a little frightening. Oh, nonsense, Kay. Well, she frightens me. Perhaps it's because she's got brains. My lovely nitwit, Kay laughed. You always call me that. Because it's what you are. They smiled at each other. Neville came over to her and, bending down, kissed the back of her neck. Lovely, lovely Kay, he murmured. Very good Kay, said Kay, giving up a lovely yachting trip to go and be snubbed by her husband's prim Victorian relations. Neville went back and sat down by the table. You know, he said, I don't see why we shouldn't go on that trip with Shirty if you really want to so much. Kay sat up in astonishment. Well, what about Salt Creek and Gull's Point? Neville said in a rather unnatural voice, I don't see why we shouldn't go there early in September. Oh, but Neville, surely... She stopped. We can't go in July and August because of the tournaments, said Neville. But we'd finish up at St. Louis the last week in August. And it would fit in very well if we went on to Salt Creek from there. It would fit in all right, beautifully, but I thought, well, she always goes there for September, doesn't she? Audrey, you mean? Yes, I, I suppose they could put her off, but why should they put her off? Kay stared at him dubiously. You mean, we'd be there at the same time? What an extraordinary idea! Neville said irritably. I don't think it's an extraordinary idea at all. Lots of people do it nowadays. Why shouldn't we all be friends together? Makes things so much simpler. Why? You said so yourself only the other day. I did? Yes, don't you remember? We were talking about the house, and you said it was the sensible, civilized way to look at things, and that Leonard's new wife and his ex were the best of friends. Oh, I wouldn't mind. I do think it's sensible, but, well, I don't think Audrey would feel like that about it. Nonsense. It isn't nonsense. You know, Neville, Audrey really was terribly fond of you. I don't think she'd stand for it for a moment. You're quite wrong, Kay. Audrey thinks it would be quite a good thing. Audrey? What do you mean, Audrey thinks? How do you know what Audrey thinks? Neville looked slightly embarrassed. He cleared his throat a little self-consciously. As a matter of fact, I happened to run into her yesterday when I was up in London. You never told me? Neville said irritably. Well, I'm telling you now. It was absolute chance. I, I was walking across the park, and there she was, coming towards me. You wouldn't want me to run away from her, would you? No, of course not, said Kay, staring. Well, go on. I, um, we, well, we stopped, of course, and then I turned round and walked with her. I, I felt it was the least I could do. Well, go on, said Kay. And then we sat down on a couple of chairs and talked. She was very nice. Very nice indeed. Delightful for you, said Kay. And we 
got talking, you know, about one thing and another. She was quite natural and normal and... and all that. Remarkable, said Kay. And she asked how you were. Oh, very kind of her. And we talked about you for a bit. Really, Kay, she couldn't have been nicer. Darling Audrey. And then it sort of came to me, you know, how, how nice it would be if... if you two could be friends, if we could all get together and it occurred to me that perhaps we might manage it at Gull's Point this summer. Sort of place it could happen quite naturally. You thought of that? I... well, y yes, of course, it was all my idea. You've never said anything to me about having any such idea? Well, I only happened to think of it just then. I see. Anyway, you suggested it, and Audrey thought it was a marvellous brainwave. For the first time, something in Kay's manner seemed to penetrate to Neville's consciousness. He said, "'Is anything the matter, Gorgeous?' "'No, no, nothing at all. It didn't occur to you or Audrey whether I should think it was a marvellous idea?' Neville stared at her. "'But, Kay, why on earth should you mind?' Kay bit her lip. Neville went on, "'You said yourself only the other day. Oh, don't go into all that again. I was talking about other people, not us.' But that's partly what made me think of it. More fool me. Not that I believe that. Neville was looking at her with dismay. But, Kay, why should you mind? I mean, there's nothing for you to mind about. Isn't there? Well, I mean, any jealousy or that would be on the other side. He paused. His voice changed. You see, Kay, you and I treated Audrey damn badly. No, I, I don't mean that. It was nothing to do with you. I treated her very badly. It's no good just saying that I couldn't help myself. I feel that if this could come off, I'd feel better about the whole thing. It would make me a lot happier. Kay said slowly, So, you haven't been happy? Darling idiot, what do you mean? Of course I've been happy, radiantly happy, but... Kay cut in, but... That's it. There's always a but in this house. Some... Damn creeping shadow about the place. Audrey's shadow. Neville stared at her. You mean to say you're jealous of Audrey? he asked. I'm not jealous of her. I'm afraid of her. Neville, you don't know what Audrey's like. Not know what she's like when I've been married to her for over eight years. You don't know, Kay repeated, what Audrey is like. April the 30th Preposterous, said Lady Tresillian. She drew herself up on her pillow and glared fiercely round the room. Absolutely preposterous. Neville must be mad. It does seem rather odd, said Mary Alden. Lady Tresillian had a striking looking profile, with a slender, bridged nose, down which, when so inclined, she could look with telling effect. Though now over seventy and in frail health, her native vigour of mind was in no way impaired. She had, it is true, long periods of retreat from life and its emotions when she would lie with half-closed eyes, but from these semi-comas she would emerge with all her faculties sharpened to the uttermost and with an incisive tongue. Propped up by pillows and a large bed set across one corner of her room, she held her court like some French queen. Mary Alden, a distant cousin, lived with her and looked after her. The two women got on together excellently. Mary was thirty-six, but had one of those smooth, ageless faces that change little with passing years. She might have been thirty, or forty-five. She had a good figure, an air of breeding, and dark hair to which one lock of white across the front gave a touch of individuality. It was at one time a fashion, but Mary's white lock of hair was natural, and she had had it since her girlhood. She looked down now reflectively at Neville Strange's letter, which Lady Tresillian had handed to her. Yes, she said. It does seem rather odd. You can't tell me, said Lady Tresillian, that this is Neville's own idea. Somebody has put it into his head, probably that new wife of his. Kay? You think it was Kay's idea? It would be quite like her, new and vulgar. If husbands and wives have to advertise their difficulties in public and have recourse to divorce, then they might at least part decently. The new wife, 
and the old wife making friends is quite disgusting in my mind. Nobody has any standards nowadays. I suppose it is just the modern way, said Mary. It won't happen in my house, said Lady Tresillian. I consider I've done all that could be asked of me, having that scarlet-toed creature here at all. She is Neville's wife, exactly. Therefore I felt that Matthew would have wished it. He was devoted to the boy, and always wanted him to look on this as his home, since to refuse to receive his wife would have made an open breach. I gave way and asked her here. I do not like her. She's quite the wrong wife for Neville. No background, no roots. She's quite well born, said Mary placatingly. Bad stock, said Lady Tresillian. Her father, as I've told you, had to resign from all his clubs after that card business. Luckily, he died shortly after, and her mother was notorious on the Riviera. What a bringing up for the girl! Nothing but hotel life and that mother. Then she meets Neville on the tennis courts, makes a dead set at him, and never rests until she gets him to leave his wife, of whom he was extremely fond, and go off with her. I blame her entirely for the whole thing. Mary smiled faintly. Lady Tresillian had the old-fashioned characteristic of always blaming the woman, and being indulgent towards the man in the case. I suppose, strictly speaking, Neville was equally to blame, she suggested. Neville was very much to blame, agreed Lady Tresillian. He had a charming wife who had always been devoted, perhaps too devoted to him. Nevertheless, if it hadn't been for that girl's persistence, I am convinced he would have come to his senses, but she was determined to marry him. Yes, my sympathies are entirely with Audrey. I am very fond of Audrey. Mary sighed. It has all been very difficult, she said. Yes, indeed. One is at a loss to know how to act in such difficult circumstances. Matthew was fond of Audrey, and so am I. And one cannot deny that she was a very good wife to Neville, though perhaps it is a pity that she could not have shared his amusements more. She was never an athletic girl. The whole business was very distressing. When I was a girl, these things simply did not happen. Men had their affairs, naturally, but they were not allowed to break up married life. Well, they happen now, said Mary, bluntly. Exactly. You have so much common sense, dear. It is of no use recalling bygone days. These things happen, and girls like Kay Mortimer steal other women's husbands, and nobody thinks the worse of them. Except people like you, Camilla. Oh, I don't count. That Kay creature doesn't worry whether I approve of her or not. She's too busy having a good time. Neville can bring her here when he comes, and I'm even willing to receive her friends, though I do not much care for that very theatrical-looking young man who is always hanging round her. What's his name? Ted Latimer? Oh, that is it. A friend of her Riviera days. And I should very much like to know how he manages to live as he does. By his wits, suggested Mary. One might pardon that. I rather fancy he lives by his looks. Not a pleasant friend for Neville's wife. I disliked the way he came down last summer and stayed at the Easterhead Bay Hotel while they were here. Mary looked out of the open window. Lady Tresillian's house was situated on a steep cliff overlooking the River Turn. On the other side of the river was the newly created summer resort of Easterhead Bay, consisting of a big sandy bathing beach, a cluster of modern bungalows, and a large hotel on the headland looking out to sea. Salt Creek itself was a straggling, picturesque fishing village set on the side of a hill. It was old-fashioned, conservative, and deeply contemptuous of Easterhead Bay and its summer visitors. The Easterhead Bay Hotel was nearly exactly opposite Lady Tresillian's house, and Mary looked across the narrow strip of water at it now, where it stood in its blatant newness. "'I am glad,' said Lady Tresillian, closing her eyes, "'that Matthew never saw that vulgar building.' The coastline was quite unspoiled in his time. Sir Matthew and Lady Tresillian had come to Gull's Point thirty years ago. It was nine years since Sir Matthew, an enthusiastic sailing man, had capsized his dinghy and been drowned, almost in front of his wife's eyes. Everybody had expected her to sell Gull's Point and leave Salt Creek, but Lady Tresillian had not done so. She had lived on in the house and her only visible reaction had been to dispose of all the boats and do away with the boathouse. There were no boats available for guests at Gull's Point. They had to walk along to the ferry and hire a boat from one of the rival boatmen there. Mary said, hesitating a little, Shall I write then to Neville and tell him that what he proposes does not fit in with our plans? 
I certainly shall not dream of interfering with Audrey's visit. She has always come to us in September, and I shall not ask her to change her plans. Mary said, looking down at the letter, You did see that Neville says Audrey, uh, approves of the idea, that she is quite willing to meet Kay? I simply don't believe it, said Lady Tresillian. Neville, like all men, believes what he wants to believe. Mary persisted. He says he has actually spoken to her about it. What a very odd thing to do. No, perhaps after all it isn't. Mary looked at her inquiringly. Like Henry the Eighth, said Lady Tresillian. Mary looked puzzled. Lady Tresillian elaborated her last remark. Conscience, you know. Henry was always trying to get Catherine to agree that the divorce was the right thing. Neville knows that he has behaved badly. He wants to feel comfortable about it all. So he has been trying to bully Audrey into saying everything is all right, and that she'll come and meet Kay, and that she doesn't mind at all. I wonder, said Mary slowly. Lady Tresillian looked at her sharply. What's in your mind, my dear? I was wondering— She stopped and then went on. It, it seems so unlike Neville, this letter. You don't think that, for some reason— Audrey wants this, this meeting. But why should she? said Lady Tresillian sharply. After Neville left her, she went to her aunt, Mrs. Royd, at the rectory, and had a complete breakdown. She was absolutely like a ghost of her former self. Obviously it hit her terribly hard. She's one of those quiet, self-contained people who feel things intensely. Mary moved uneasily. Yes, she is intense. A queer girl, in many ways. She suffered a lot. Then the divorce went through, and Neville married the girl, and little by little Audrey began to get over it. Now she's almost back to her old self. You can't tell me she wants to rake up old memories again. Mary said with gentle obstinacy. Neville says she does. The old lady looked at her curiously. You're extraordinarily obstinate about this, Mary. Why? Do you want to have them here together? Mary Alden flushed. No, of course not. Lady Tresillian said sharply, "'It's not you who have been suggesting all this to Neville. <laughs> How can you be so absurd? Well, I don't believe for a minute. It's really his idea. It's not like Neville.' She paused a minute. Then her face cleared. "'It's the first of May tomorrow, isn't it?' "'Well, on the third, Audrey is coming to stay with the Darlingtons at Esbank. It's only twenty miles away. Write and ask her to come over and lunch here.' May the 5th. Mrs. Strange, my lady. Audrey Strange came into the big bedroom, crossed the room to the big bed, stooped down, kissed the old lady, and sat down in a chair placed ready for her. Nice to see you, my dear, said Lady Tresillian. And nice to see you, said Audrey. There was a quality of intangibility about Audrey Strange. She was of medium height, with very small hands and feet. Her hair was ash-blonde, and there was very little colour in her face. Her eyes were set wide apart, and were a clear, pale grey. Her features were small and regular, a straight little nose set in a small, oval, pale face. With such colouring, with a face that was pretty but not beautiful, she had nevertheless a quality about her that could not be denied nor ignored and that drew your eyes to her again and again. She was a little like a ghost, but you felt at the same time that a ghost might be possessed of more reality than a live human being. She had a singularly lovely voice, soft and clear like a small silver bell. For some minutes she and the old lady talked of mutual friends and current events. Then Lady Tresillian said, "'Besides the pleasure of seeing you, my dear,' I asked you to come because I've had rather a curious letter from Neville. Audrey looked up. Her eyes were wide, tranquil, and calm. She said, Oh, yes. He suggests, <laughs> a preposterous suggestion, I call it, that he and, um, and Kay should come here in September. He says he wants you and Kay to be friends, and that you yourself think it a good idea. She waited. Presently, Audrey said in her gentle, placid voice, Is it so preposterous? My dear, do you really want this to happen? 
Audrey was silent again for a minute or two. Then she said gently, I think, you know, it might be rather a good thing. You really want to meet this... You want to meet Kay? I do think, Camilla, that it might simplify things. Simplify things? Lady Tresillian repeated the words helplessly. Audrey spoke very softly. Dear Camilla, you have been so good. If Neville wants this... The fig for what Neville wants, said Lady Tresillian robustly. Do you want it? That's the question. A little colour came in Audrey's cheeks. It was the soft, delicate glow of a seashell. Yes, she said. I do want it. Well, said Lady Tresillian. Well. She stopped. But of course, said Audrey, it's entirely your choice. It's your house, and... Lady Tresillian shut her eyes. I'm an old woman, she said. Nothing makes sense any more. But of course, I'll come some other time. Any time will suit me. You'll come in September, as you always do, snapped Lady Tresillian. And Neville and Kay shall come too. I may be old, but I can adapt myself, I suppose, as well as anyone else, to the changing phases of modern life. Not another word, that's settled. She closed her eyes again. After a minute or two, she said, peering through half-shut lids at the young woman sitting beside her, Well, got what you want? Audrey started. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. My dear, said Lady Tresillian, and her voice was deep and concerned. Are you sure this isn't going to hurt you? You were very fond of Neville, you know. This may reopen old wounds. Audrey was looking down at her small gloved hands. One of them, Lady Tresillian noticed, was clenched on the side of the bed. Audrey lifted her head. Her eyes were calm and untroubled. She said, All that is quite over now. Quite over. Lady Tresillian leaned more heavily back on her pillows. Well, you should know. I'm tired. You must leave me now, dear. Mary is waiting for you downstairs. Tell them to send Barrett to me. Barrett was Lady Tresillian's elderly and devoted maid. She came in to find her mistress lying back with closed eyes. The sooner I am out of this world, the better, Barrett, said Lady Tresillian. I don't understand anything, or anyone in it. Ah, don't say that, my lady. You're tired. Yes. I'm tired. Take that eider down off my feet and give me a dose of my tonic. It's Mrs. Strange coming that's upset you. A nice lady. But she could do with a tonic, I'd say, not healthy. Always looks as though she's seen things other people don't see. She's got a lot of character. She makes herself felt, as you might say. That's very true, Barrett, said Lady Tresillian. Yes, it's very true. And she's not the kind you forget easily, either. I've often wondered if Mr. Neville thinks about her sometimes. The new Mrs. Strange is very handsome, very handsome indeed. But Miss Audrey is the kind you remember when she isn't there. Lady Tresillian said with a sudden chuckle, Neville's a fool to want to bring those two women together. He's the one who'll be sorry for it. May the 29th Thomas Royd, pipe in mouth, was surveying the progress of his packing, with which the deft-fingered Malayan number one boy was busy. Occasionally his glance shifted to the view over the plantations. For some six months he would not see that view, which had been so familiar for the past seven years. It would be queer to be in England again. Alan Drake, his partner, looked in. Hello, Thomas. How goes it? All set now. Come and have a drink, you lucky devil. I'm consumed with envy. Thomas Royd moved slowly out of the bedroom and joined his friend. He did not speak, for Thomas Royd was a man singularly economical of words. His friends had learned to gauge his reactions correctly from the quality of his silences. A rather thick-set figure with a straight, solemn face and observant, thoughtful eyes, 
He walked a little sideways, crab-like. This, the result of being jammed in a door during an earthquake, had contributed towards his nickname of the Hermit Crab. It had left his right arm and shoulder partially helpless, which, added to an artificial stiffness of gait, often led people to think he was feeling shy and awkward, when in reality he seldom felt anything of the kind. Alan Drake mixed the drinks. Well, he said, good hunting? Roy had said something that sounded like a hum. Drake looked at him curiously. Phlegmatic as ever, he remarked. Don't know how you manage it. How long is it since you went home? Seven years. Nearer eight. It's a long time. Wonder you haven't gone completely native. Perhaps I have. You always did belong to our dumb friends rather than to the human race. Planned out your leave? Well, yes, partly. The bronze, impassive face took a sudden and a deeper brick-red tinge. Alan Drake said with lively astonishment, I believe there's a girl. Damn it all, you are blushing. Thomas Royd said rather huskily, Don't be a fool. And he drew very hard on his ancient pipe. He broke all previous records by continuing the conversation himself. Dare say, he said, I shall find things a bit changed. Alan Drake said curiously, I've always wondered why you chucked going home last time. Right at the last minute, too. Royd shrugged his shoulders. Thought that shooting trip might be interesting. Bad news from home about then. Oh, of course, I forgot. Your brother was killed. In that motoring accident. Thomas Royd nodded. Drake reflected that, all the same, it seemed a curious reason for putting off a journey home. If there was a mother, he believed also a sister. Surely at such a time... Then he remembered something. Thomas had cancelled his passage before the news of his brother's death arrived. Alan looked at his friend curiously. Dark horse, old Thomas. After a lapse of three years, he could ask, Are you and your brother great pals? Adrian and I? Well, not particularly. Each of us always went his own way. He was a barrister. Yes, thought Drake. A very different life. Chambers in London, parties, a living urn by the shrewd use of the tongue. He reflected that Adrian Royd must have been a very different chap from old Silent Thomas. Your mother's alive, isn't she? The mater? Yes. And you've got a sister, too. Thomas shook his head. Oh, I, I thought you had, in that snapshot. Royd mumbled. Not a sister, sort of distant cousin or something. Brought up with us because she was an orphan. Once more a slow tide of colour suffused the bronzed skin. Drake thought, Hello? He said, Is she married? Uh, she was. Married that fellow, Neville Strange. A fellow who plays tennis and rackets and all that? Yes. She divorced him. And you're going home to try your luck with her, thought Drake. Mercifully, he changed the subject of conversation. Going to get any fishing or shooting? She'll go home first. Then I thought of doing a bit of sailing down at Salt Creek. I know it. Attractive little place. Rather a decent old-fashioned hotel there. Yes. The Balmoral Court. May stay there, or may put up with friends who've got a house there. Sounds all right to me. Uh -huh. Nice. Peaceful place, Salt Creek. Nobody to hustle you. I know, said Drake. The kind of place where nothing ever happens. May the 29th It really is most annoying, said old Mr. Treves. For twenty-five years now I have been to the Marine Hotel at Lee Head. And now, would you believe it, the whole place is being pulled down widening the front, or some nonsense of that kind. Why they can't let these seaside places alone, Lee Head always had a peculiar charm of its own. Regency. Pure regency. Rufus Lord said consolingly, Still, there are other places to stay there, I suppose. I really don't feel I can go to Lee Head at all, but the Marine 
Mrs. Mackay understood my requirements perfectly. I had the same rooms every year, and there was hardly ever a change in the service, and the cooking was excellent, quite excellent. Oh, what about trying Salt Creek? There's rather a nice old-fashioned hotel there. The Balmoral Court. I'll tell you who keeps it. Couple of the name of Rogers. She used to be cook to old Lord Mounthead. He had the best dinners in London. She married the butler, and they run this hotel now. Sounds to me just your kind of place. Quiet. None of these jazz bands, and first-class cooking and service. It's an idea. It's certainly an idea. Is there a sheltered terrace? Yes. A covered-in veranda and a terrace beyond. You can get sun or shade as you prefer. I can give you some introductions in the neighbourhood, too, if you like. There's old Lady Tresillian. She lives almost next door. A charming house, and she herself is a delightful woman, in spite of being very much of an invalid. But the judge's widow, do you mean? That's it. I used to know Matthew Tresillian, and I think I've met her. A charming woman, though, of course, that's a long time ago. Salt Creek is near St. Lou, isn't it? I've several friends in that part of the world. Do you know, I really think Salt Creek is a very good idea. I shall write and get particulars. The middle of August is when I wish to go there. The middle of August to the middle of September. There is a garage for the car, I suppose? And my chauffeur? Oh, yes. It's thoroughly up to date. Because, as you know, I have to be careful about walking uphill. I should prefer rooms on the ground floor, though I suppose there is a lift. Oh, yes, all that sort of thing. It sounds, said Mr. Treves, as though it would solve my problem perfectly, and I should enjoy renewing my acquaintance with Lady Tresillian. Mm.